Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> see people are still trickling in. It is exactly 1.15, so we'll give folks a second to come back from lunch. I hope you had a good break. I went for a short little walk, which my dog enjoyed, which hopefully means that she won't be barking during this. Um, let me get everything pulled up here. All right, well, it's officially uh, 1 16, so um, I officially begin our session. Um, so, this session is Record Keeper or Keeper of Record The Search for Primary Sources in 1898 Coup d'etat Citations. Um, this presentation is by Rebecca Bonyan and Nicole Yatsonsky, both from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, so I'll go ahead and queue up their presentation and then we'll have some time for um, question and answers afterwards. Um, and feel free to put in the chat if there are any issues with this, but I've practiced numerous times, so I don't think there will be. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Bonio and I'm the Special Collections Librarian at UNC Wilmington. I'm presenting with my Special Collections colleague, Nicole Yatsonsky. Today we're going to discuss a nascent research project that we have just started working on that analyzes the primary source citations used in scholarship, literature, and media pertaining to the 1898 coup d'etat and massacre in Wilmington, North Carolina. The title of our presentation is Records Keeper or Keeper of Record, the Search for Primary Sources in 1898 Coup d'etat Citations. In Chapter 2 of Urgent Archives and Acting Liberatory Memory Work, Michelle Caswell writes, if historical time is cyclical rather than linear, traces of the past are not activated to envision a distant and wholly uncertain future, but rather to mark corollary moments or reoccurring points in the now. In this way, records pinpoint the repetition of histories of oppression rather than discrete contained moments on an irreversible progressive march ending in liberation. We must shift the focus then of the archival imaginary from some future moment to the present as users of archives search for past corollaries to their current situation through archival use. Caswell defines corollary moments as a point in time with historical precedence where the pendulum swings back to the same place it had been before. Though chapter two focuses on the ways in which corollary records can be activated to support activist communities in the present, at a simpler level, these concepts can be applied to the interests sparked in everyday citizens following historically important events. In the city of Wilmington, a dark corollary moment of the past has found renewed public interest amidst the nation's reckoning with racial inequality, the invigoration of the Black Lives Matter movement, and the 2021 insurrection at the Capitol. Wilmington's corollary moment began in the late 1890s with a carefully executed white supremacy political campaign and culminated in election intimidation, severe racial violence against the Black community, and the overthrow and banishment of the locally elected government. These events are now known as the 1898 coup d'etat and massacre. In the preceding 124 years since 1898, narrative and public discourse on the topic have shifted slowly from a narrative created and promoted by the white perpetrators of the coup to a counter-narrative supported by primary source evidence, oral tradition, and scholarship on systemic racism. In the aftermath of November 10, 1898, the perpetrators of the coup carefully crafted a narrative justifying their actions. Subsequently, this narrative was perpetuated for decades by the white elite and the rhetoric was invoked as a mechanism of suppression time and again. Between 1898 and 1951, the events of 1898 became known as the Wilmington Revolution, the Wilmington Rebellion, and the Wilmington Race Riot. During this period, the papers and typescript recollections of 1898 by influential white Wilmingtonians were donated to libraries and archives. Since the city did not yet have an archival repository, these manuscripts were donated to such places as Duke University, UNC Chapel Hill, and the State Archives. In some cases, materials were even accompanied by letters justifying the aforementioned narrative. 
For example, accompanying newspaper owner Thomas W. Clausen's recollections of 1898 is a letter by Wilmington historian Louis T. Moore in which he states, the account is interesting and worth preservation in state archives. It gives the fundamental points which finally go to the people of Wilmington into taking action to protect their homes and liberties. In 1951, Dr. Helen Edmonds, professor of history at North Carolina College, now North Carolina Central University, published the book, The Negro Infusion Politics in North Carolina, 1898 to 1901. This work challenged the dominant white narrative of 1898 for the first time. As a result, she was vilified by local white citizens who mounted a public campaign to discredit the work. Today, her book is one of the most used secondary sources in scholarship on 1898. Between 1951 and 1998, more scholarly works on the coup were published, notably including Jerome McDuffie's dissertation, Politics in Wilmington and New Hanover County, North Carolina, 1865 to 1900, The Genesis of a Race Riot, June Nash's journal article, The Cost of Violence, and Leon Prather's We Have Taken the City. Suspicion and mistrust climax after the publication of Edmund's book and donations of manuscript materials contemporary to 1898 appear to diminish. According to notes in these works, access to primary sources and the private possessions of both blacks and whites became difficult to obtain. Oral tradition indicates that access to sources and repositories, particularly in newly established collections in Wilmington, was made available only to select individuals. Though instances of suppression of the counter narrative of 1898 surfaced as late as the early 1990s, the Wilmington community began planning a centennial recognition of, with the intention of rectifying the dominant white narrative and attempting to begin a reconciliation process similar to that of the Tulsa massacre. These activities initiated an expansion of the scholarly treatment of 1898 between, between the mid-1990s and the early 2000s, including the state commissioned report completed by Lee Ray Umfleet, numerous peer-reviewed journal articles, and the publication Democracy Betrayed, edited by David C. Selesky and Timothy Tyson. The 2000s ushered a shift away from the academic arena as public knowledge of 1898 increased. In recent years, it has become common to see works that may be typified as gray literature or information produced outside of traditional publishing and distribution channels, as well as works in media and literary journalism, including a well-known example of David Zucchino's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Wilmington's Lie. With the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement, community and interest in 1898 has increased significantly. The January 6th insurrection at the Capitol thrust 1898 into the national spotlight with a proliferation of national news coverage documenting this corollary moment in history. Public interest in learning more about the 1898 coup has increased significantly as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement and the January 6th insurrection. This exposure is evident through the increase in associated reference transactions that we received in 2020 and 2021 as one of two main archival repositories in the subject city. Beyond the increase, there was also an observable shift in researcher demographics as we fielded requests from students attending universities out of state and abroad K-12 teachers, journalists, and other media-affiliated individuals, and many community citizens. Reference requests primarily sought sources contemporary to 1898. A common refrain among requests was, I'd like to see everything you have on 1898. However, as I mentioned before, archival repositories were not established in Wilmington until the 1950s, and many sources were donated to UNC, Duke, and the State Archive. Aside from published works, our manuscript holdings at UNC Wilmington primarily portray the evolution of the city in the aftermath of 1898. Subsequently, reference work on this topic involved a lot of referrals to other repositories. So, knowing that primary sources contemporary to the time were scattered in archives across the state, we decided to create an all-inclusive subject guide that could be sent to researchers as a starting point. This guide was published in August 2020. When the insurrection at the Capitol occurred on January 6, news coverage in the days that followed made reference to the 1898 coup as a corollary moment in history. Links to the subject guide from major news outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and NPR proliferated. In text, the guide was often linked in the context of a historical summary of the events, and one article even included the line, historians say, in reference to us, Nicole and myself. To be honest, this kind of news coverage started to make us feel uncomfortable. 
were not historians by professional definition and do not claim to be so. At the same time, we also started to notice discrepancies in primary source citations as we worked to answer reference requests. This was especially true of photos from 1898, the single most requested source, but also extended to other cited sources. Anecdotally, it seemed like we were part of a cycle of referrals from one archive to another in a researcher's attempt to track down a particular source. Additionally, we were grappling with claims made in media on 1898 that we could not substantiate, nor had they been cited in any scholarly works. Requests to assist in locating primary sources that verified those claims were especially difficult. It seemed that as the varying types of works studying the 1898 coup increased, so too did the issues of credibility and reliability. We began to feel the need to understand the landscape of sources available beyond our normal responsibilities associated with this type of work. Who else, if not us? As our presentation title suggests, are we records keepers only or have we incidentally started to become the keepers of record? These questions compelled us to begin exploring research opportunities. In reviewing research methods, we discovered Anne Gilliland and Sue McKimish's article, Building an Infrastructure for Archival Research. This article was particularly helpful as a starting point for nascent researchers, and we especially appreciated the research design model outlined by the authors and recreated here. The horizontal line identifies the stages involved in designing a research project. The vertical inputs represent considerations that influence the establishment of research goals and how they are pursued. Below the horizontal line are three feedback loops. Two loops address situations where the research design needs to be modified for unforeseen reasons, such as the need to add to the study or an unanticipated finding. The third feedback loop represents how the findings generate new ideas and questions that lead to the development of further research projects. We considered these stages and inputs as we developed our research questions and methodology. We felt that bibliometric and specifically citation analysis would be the best research method for this particular project. However, research in this area primarily focuses on peer-reviewed works in the sciences and social sciences. Analysis is much more difficult for works in the humanities and we have not yet been able to locate studies that focus exclusively on primary sources for many good reasons, as it turns out. Nevertheless, we discovered a subset of scholarship within citation analysis research that focuses on problematic citation behavior. Since we are in fact attempting to identify problematic citation behavior, we've chosen to adapt some definitions from this research that can be applied to our own niche project. In an article on problematic citations in business ethics research, Professor Alexander Serenko opens with the statement, Citations play a vital epistemic role because they enable communities of researchers to collectively construct knowledge by extending the works of previous scholars. As such, the role and impact of citations are unarguable. He defines problematic citation behavior as the use of citations in a way that can impede the growth of knowledge. Serenko specifically identifies two types of problematic citation behavior. First, inaccurate citations, which refer to mistakes in citation entries such as an incorrect author name, publication date, title, volume, page, etc., which are primarily due to trivial oversight and negligence. And second, plagiarized citations, which occur when authors copy and paste erroneous citation entries from other publications, carrying forward errors in their own work. In these cases, Serenko contends that it is possible that offending authors may not have consulted the original work. Anecdotal evidence from our reference work on 1898 indicates the need for a third behavior not previously defined in scholarship on problematic citation behaviors. We intend to call this behavior misidentified citations. This behavior appears to be unique to primary sources given their nature. For example, details such as marginalia that render a source wholly different than its like counterparts. Therefore, we are defining misidentified citations as errors or omissions in the citation which do not lead a researcher to the particular source used or makes undeniably incorrect attributions and or associations. Using the concepts of problematic citation behavior, we intend to perform a comprehensive citation analysis on select scholarship literature and media pertaining to the 1898 coup. 
Based on our observations over the last two years, we developed the following research questions. Number one, are primary source citations used in scholarship literature and media pertaining to the 1898 coup d'etat and massacre accurate? Number two, are the cited sources available and or accessible in the repositories in which they are cited? And number three, will this citation analysis reveal the use of new primary sources over time? Conversely, will it reveal the disuse of primary sources over time? Through question one, we intend to collect data on inaccurate, plagiarized, and misidentified citations. Through question two, we intend to explore findings pertaining to suspected plagiarized and misidentified citations. And through question three, we intend to compare the use, disuse, and appearance of sources over time against the rhetoric and public discourse on 1898. The following is a loose research methodology for this work that we hope to refine as we dive deeper into the project. Selection of works to include in the citation analysis is fairly straightforward since we already compiled a comprehensive list of sources when creating the subject guide and have continued to maintain that list. Given the wide variety of publications available, especially in the gray lit area, we have set a few parameters to abide by. So sources must contain substantive content about the coup in Wilmington and sources must contain recognizable citations in any format or an image credit for use of photographs and media. In order to contain the discovery of new secondary works, we are allowing new sources to be added if they are cited in a previously selected work and they satisfy both parameters. For each work, we intend to review the footnotes, endnotes, chapter notes, and bibliographies. Data will be compiled in a spreadsheet designed specifically for this project. Beyond various components of the in-text and bibliographic citations, we intend to collect information such as descriptive citation notes, descriptive access points such as catalog records and finding aids, and digitization status. We anticipate that the acquisition and analysis pieces of this work will be iterative in nature. Though we plan to be conscientious in looking for citation errors across selected works, we intend to complete a deeper dive on the most used primary sources in order to answer research questions number one and two. At the moment, we're thinking we may isolate this to the 10 most used sources, but we plan to make a determination when the analysis is complete. As with any research methodology, we know at the outset that there are some limitations to our research. The first is the limited amount of scholarship pertaining to citation analysis within the humanities and specifically for primary sources. If this is an area that you, the audience, is aware of, we would appreciate any recommendations that you have. We are also facing a lack of common citation standards in some areas of gray literature and in commercially published works such as literary journalism. This lack of standards makes it necessary for us to compare individual components of citations. Additionally, we are particularly aware of changes made within archives. We are reviewing works from a period with significant technological development and the advent of the internet. Transfer of information from card catalogs and paper finding aids to online catalogs and content management systems provides a wide margin of error and data loss. Reprocessing and transfer of collections is also at play. All of this certainly impacts the way citations are created and we have to keep these variables in mind during the analysis. Similarly, we want to be conscientious and very careful about making assumptions with regard to plagiarized citations if we find any at all. The use of reproductions and digitization technology has greatly enhanced access to sources and archival visits are no longer essential. We also need to be aware of the use and disuse of primary sources held in private collections, as well as the revelation of new sources, both of which could potentially impact analytical assumptions. And finally, the feasibility of verifying sources in out-of-state repositories is limited at the moment. So we have started the data acquisition phase of our work, and my colleague Nicole is going to share some examples of problematic citation behavior that we have discovered to date, as well as some spin-off research activities that we have identified as potentially worth exploring in the future. Thank you, Rebecca. That now brings us into some examples of the work we're doing with the primary source citation analysis. Two of the most commonly used sources are two photos of the Daily Record newspaper building from the day of the coup and a work by Harry Hayden titled The Story of the Wilmington Rebellion. 
Both photos were taken by local photographer Henry Cronenberg on the day of the coup, showing a large group of white men, many with weapons, beside the burning building of the Black-owned Daily Record, whose editor was Alex Manley of the famed editorial that was blamed for inciting the events of November 10th. Both photos are the most commonly used photos across all examined secondary sources. Version 1 on the left is a scan of the original photo currently housed at the New Hanover County Public Library, which is usually cited as such. Though there are multiple media articles that cite either Genby Images or Alamy, where descriptions of the photos are vague at best or completely inaccurate at worst. The use of the photos from those must also be paid for when the photos are actually in the public domain. A cursory reference search would have led them to a free resource. Version 2 on the right is taken from a different angle and with people on the roof. The version shown here is the way the photo most commonly appears as a black and white scan, though the original is slightly tinted from the actual printing in Collier's Weekly, which is readily available via the Cape Fear Museum's Flickr page, linked from their website, or referred via a Google search. The first work to include one of the photos was the November 26th, 1898 issue of Collier's Weekly, published two weeks after the events of the coup. It's the second version with the people on the roof, as shown here. The Collier's Weekly scan is obvious due to a small number five in a circle in the bottom left corner, as indicated by the arrow. Though many sites trim the photo, thus cutting it off. But anyone looking at the original page and then the photo would know that was where it was from if it had the number. The few correct citations of this version have only been found in published works. The photo next appeared in Prather's 1984 work, We Have Taken a City, after which means anyone going back through published works related to 1898 would be able to identify where it was initially sourced through past citation use. The first version of the photo without the people on the roof did not appear in any examined sources until 2006. Of the two, the second version with the people on the roof is the most vaguely or inaccurately cited, even though it has been around the longest and previously accurately cited. This is the one I'll be discussing going forward. Several secondary sources do cite Collier's Weekly or Collier's Weekly and then where they accessed it, for example, the Library of Congress or the North Carolina State Archives. But most citations, especially in media articles, will list just the Library of Congress without mentioning Collier's Weekly. According to their website, the Library of Congress does have copies of Collier's Weekly from then in microform and a digital scan of the photo collage shown here. And the North Carolina State Archives also has a digital version available from a negative of the scan page, though they don't have a physical copy themselves. Their digital copy description does identify the photo as being from Collier's Weekly, so it's unclear how or why that information would be later dropped in the actual work. Either way, an ideal citation would include the original source of the photo, the repository or resource used to access it, and, depending on its context in a work, a brief description of what is shown, all of which is rarely found complete in works that include the photo, especially media articles. Here is an example of an inaccurate citation in a newspaper article. The date listed is wrong. It's actually the 26th, not the 27th, which again is indicated in the description of the photograph on the State Archives website. So this was likely a typo, the one that would be easily caught if someone double checked the source. This example on the left shows a page that includes the photo from David Zucchino's Wilmington's Lie. The image to the right is the photo citation list at the front of the book. This citation is inaccurate because it does not include the original source of Collier's Weekly. Additionally, the separation of the photo from an organization of the photo citation list, which is neither arranged in the order the photos are printed, nor by creator, source, or date, is undesirable as it inhibits easy attribution and reference. Here is an example of an ideal citation. It provides the original source, context around what is shown, and where it was accessed. It lists Collier's Weekly, the original source, the date, November 26, 1898, what you're looking at, the original caption from the page in Collier's Weekly, additional context, the importance of the daily record and what happened, and where the image was sourced, the Cape Fear Museum. The second source example is the story of the Wilmington Rebellion by Harry Hayden. On the left, the published version was printed and marketed by Hayden himself in 1936. Hayden was a boy in Wilmington in 1898 and later became a journalist. This text recounts the events surrounding and during the day of the coup, including the first mention of the members of the Secret Nine and their pre-planned involvement in the violence. 
On the right, the typescript is an expanded version of his original published work and was likely written after 1951 in response to Helen Edmonds' book that sought to shift the narrative about the coup for the first time, marking the white Democrats, not the black community, as the true instigators and perpetrators. Though it draws heavily on the original text, the two versions are not the same, as the typescript includes additional information and quotes obtained in the two decades since the original publication. Hayden's account is used heavily in nearly every scholarly secondary source examined. Some works use just the published version, while others use both. Part of our eventual research will also identify if some may be referencing or citing the original published version while actually using the typescript, and vice versa, without realizing the text was not the same. There is actually also a third version shown here, which is a copy of the publication that contains transcribed type notes originally written by J.A. Taylor or John Allen Taylor, a member of the Secret Nine, the group that planned the coup. He contributes additional details and information to certain parts of the text. This particular copy has been cited independently from the regular published version and typescript. As you can see in the image, for some reason the notes were copied with S.A. Taylor as the author, but this was likely due to difficulty reading the original handwriting, as a capital J and S would look similar in script. A note at the beginning of this copy indicates it should be J.A. and not S.A. The first known citation for the published version is 1951 by Helen Edmonds in her book. The J.A. Taylor version is cited in 1963 by Jerome McDuffie for his thesis, and the typescript in 1969 by Ralph B. Cornegy for his thesis. We've noticed that both the name of the typescript, the collection title it was in, and the repository location has changed multiple times throughout the secondary sources. Here is an example of primary source confusion due to multiple versions of Hayden's story existing. This is from Democracy Betrayed, published in 1998. Two authors both used the published and typescript versions of Hayden, only one chapter apart, and yet identified them differently. Prather used the published version, as well as the typescript copy held at Duke, and cited them separately as such on top. On the bottom, Gilmore incorrectly identified the author of the typescript as HLW, because a small paragraph on the first page of the typescript reprints a newspaper article by HLW, aka journalist Henry Litfield West. But a quick examination of the rest of the typescript shows its similarity, and in some case verbatim sentences, to Hayden's published work. Thus, she missed that they were in fact by the same author, even as she later cites the particular story from the events was accounted for in both versions. Had she more closely examined Prather's earlier chapter, or even his 1984 work that it was drawn from, which she also even cites as a source she used for her own work, it seems confounding that she was not able to make the connection between the materials and past citations, particularly as Prather details in his bibliographic essay of his 1984 work that the typescript was a later, fuller version of Hayden's earlier work. These have been just a few examples we have come across, among other quandaries, during our primary source analysis, of which we are still in the middle of. This has led us to discover synergistic and spin-off research areas that work in connection with this project, largely from cited primary sources that we weren't as familiar with and wanted more information about, or that we found connections between cited sources of which we hadn't realized previously and wanted to explore more. These listed here are just a few we're considering as we move forward, but one of which ties directly into this work and will now be the second phase of our research project is the secondary source analysis. Over the course of our primary source analysis, we made an interesting observation as we progressed into contemporary works, that early seminal secondary sources on 1898 have fallen out of use. Why is that? And what has changed over time to cause it? Have shifts in the accepted reality of the 1898 coup meant some sources naturally fell away as the corrected narrative was established? Or has lazy scholar syndrome led to a reliance on gray literature, whose content would be disseminated under fewer standards for peer review and citation accuracy? These questions led to what will be the second part of our research, a secondary source analysis, examining these cited secondary sources to track their use and prevalence over time in the hopes a clear motivation is revealed. Throughout our entire research project, we found ourselves asking questions of, of which we don't yet and may never have informed answers for. Mainly, what is our role as archivists in recommending works of varying integrity to researchers? 
and specifically as it relates to what we recommend on our 1898 subject guide, shown here, would removing works of questionable credibility and reliability be considered censorship? At what point is authority actually established in ourselves as archivists and also in non-scholarly sources so that either are considered credible and reliable? We look forward to seeing where this research takes us and if we will be able to resolve any of the questions this project has raised, or if, like so many of the sources we've examined, the answers are destined to remain gray. Thank you. Awesome. That was so fantastic and so interesting. Thank you both. Um, I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. Um, I am the Special and Digital Collections Librarian out at Western Carolina University, and I know that there are a number of materials that in citations get um, attributed to our institution, and those have been replicated, and we often get people um, approaching us asking for those and um, we don't have them. So very relevant. So um, if folks have um, questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, but I'll start off. I think that's such a great idea putting together that subject guide that kind of brings together materials across various institutions. We have a number of kind of um, topics that are similar. And I was wondering if you had done any collaboration or um, kind of conversation with some of the other institutions that hold those materials kind of around making that subject guide and if they had any input or if they found that valuable at all. Um, so Nicole and I uh, worked together and we, because this work primarily occurred during the pandemic, we um, mainly relied on the scholarship of 1898 to create the guide, um, as opposed to trying to work with other institutions, mainly because there are so many collections that are commonly used throughout every source that it, it's it's pretty quick. Um, I will say that since we've created the guide, we've also noticed that those same institutions have digitized many, if not, I would say most of those materials, which has made it um, extremely helpful to us in doing the reference work. And I think that at some point in the future, a next step would be to work with institutions to make sure that the most requested sources are more readily available than um, just uh, in the archive itself as a visit. And I'll let Nicole, she um, created the guide, add anything if she wants. Um, no, we didn't, we didn't reach out in the sense of then. We have definitely reached out now to a few people as we've been trying to track down the sources, which has been helpful to know um, as we're citing particular letters, like one letter may be in a collection that doesn't necessarily relate to 1898, but that one letter does. Um, so confirming that, in fact, that is in there um, has been really helpful. And we, the guide um, is ongoing, so we make changes to it as we find more things. And certainly um, as we talk to other people, as we continue looking through sources, um, you know, it would be great to work with other people. And we hope that in other institutions like Chapel Hill or the State Archives that they can then use our guide as a reference to to help researchers, because I'm sure everyone gets someone across the state looking for this particular topic, especially now. So we're definitely open to um, collaborating as much as possible to make it easier on all of us who get the reference requests and then also the researchers so they don't have to try to hit the 18 different locations where things are, which was one of the goals with that. So that's really terrific. I'm definitely um, putting that on my future list of projects to do because we have some similar collections. Um, so um, We've got a question in the chat from Stephanie. Um, she says, fascinating. How did you determine what to analyze? Seems like it would be hard to narrow down uh, works about 1898. Um, when we created the guide, we gathered a long list of um, published works, published and unpublished works, I guess, on um, 1898. We felt like the, the begin date of that would be Helen Edmonds 1951 book, 
um, which is the first time that the narrative was challenged. And then we started to look at works after that point in time. Um, I think as we mentioned in the presentation, we're choosing to focus on works that include citations and that primarily contain substantive content about 1898 as opposed to um, some references, which there are a lot of works that reference it um, in relation to other topics. So that does narrow it down to a more manageable list. Um, the, the list is still pretty long. There are many dissertations and theses um, out there that we're having to take a look at and a lot of journal articles. So it's there's a lot of heavy lifting, but we feel like it's worth the work at this point, um, given how much we're having to answer requests on this topic and um, that we wanna be as well versed in this area as possible um, for our campus constituents and our community constituents. Awesome, and Nicole has put uh, the link to that guide in the chat uh, for those of you that would like to see it. Um, and Stephanie does, says, says it makes a lot of sense. Um, other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you're also welcome to unmute and, and ask them um, with your voice. Good folks. A minute if they're typing. Um, I was wondering if a part of the guide was, I presume that a part of it would be providing accurate citations for folks to use. Um, is there kind of some guidance that you're going to be offering researchers in hopes that they find it and are going to correctly attribute um, the images and other items? That is a really good question. And I, I also feel like it's a really difficult question to answer because there are so many different types of citation formats and different uses. Um, that's a, a good point though. And I don't think that we do offer any sort of um, specific direction on the guide though I could see in the future at the after we come to the end of this work where that may be necessary. Um, or at least what components could be included. Um, I think some issues that complicate the answer are, for example, in finding aids um, across libraries, the recommended citation format can differ um, depending on the university or the archive um, and depending on the use of the source itself, whether it's in a, a published work or um, in an internet website, art, journal article, or newspaper article, um, the space given for that changes. Um, and certainly we're seeing with in what we're calling literary journalism, but with um, a, an example being David Zucchino's book, the citation formats vary significantly from what is established in the scholarly and academic arena. So we don't know how, like, who controls that? Um, and we hope that they would follow recommendations, but I don't think that we can only do so much. But I think we're open to suggestions too. <laughs> it's a complicated situation. No, and that, that definitely is tricky to, um, I think oftentimes as archivists, we want to kind of help point people in the right direction, but at the end of the day, that's not always our role. Um, any other questions? Good folks, another second. Go ahead and unmute or use the little hand raise function. Uh, Sarah Esther says, just wanted to say thanks for the presentation and subject guide. I was unaware of the coup until today. Um, yeah, I think it's definitely an important topic. And I, I 
hope that you come back next year and share what you found. Um, I think this is such a, a useful and important and um, really unique project. So, um, and I, I'll go ahead and put up the slide again um, with your contact information. So if anyone wants to reach out to you afterwards, um, otherwise we'll have a few minutes. The next session starts at 2.15. Um, and Zachary shared a link in the chat um, that has a really good uh, introduction to the coup um, for those of you that want to learn more. And yes, I think there'll be lots of interest to see what you, you have found. Um, so I'll go ahead and put up that slide, um, but otherwise, thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for attending, everyone. Take care. <laughs>